Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I was last in Singapore in 1981 as a uh, backpacking hippie, and I have to say it's changed a lot uh, since then. Um, so it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's also a pleasure to speak about technology at a technological university. I think the role of technology in society and, as an intellect and, and understanding it as a broader intellectual pursuit is something that's uh, underrepresented in the intellectual uh, debates. So um, today I'm going to begin by giving you two different kinds of motivations for why to think about technology. The first one will be fairly theoretical, that is thinking about technology as an evolutionary process. But then I'm going to give you some much more practical motivations for understanding economic growth and in particular for thinking about public policy for things like green energy. I'm then going to talk about some empirical studies that we've been doing, collecting data on technological progress, trying to make some sense out of what's going on, trying to understand why some technologies improve dramatically, whereas others don't improve at all through time. Um, and then I'm going to begin by saying, at the end of my talk, speaking about theories of technological progress and uh, from several different perspectives. And ending with some remarks uh, about the work we're doing now using a patent uh, record as a, as a fossil record. So um, technology is something that's been with us a long time. The first, it, it, uh, many would argue that, that technology has co-evolved with genus homo. In fact, the, the, the usage of tools may have, may have been a significant driver in the development of the brain. First, the, the, the first fossils of Homo habilis, already 2.3 million years ago, show tools along with them. And as, and, and Homo habilis, by the way, had a brain the size of a chimpanzee, and yet we already see tools. And as we go through time, it, it, during the, the period of evolution from then till Homo sapiens, roughly 125,000 neurons were being added each generation. So as people were using tools, their brains were expanding. Now, I, I always have to show this slide. Of course, this is much later. But uh, just to show that technology has been used for even recreational purposes, in fact, probably practical purposes as well, for quite a long time. Um, now, the idea that technology should be thought about in evolutionary terms, I would argue, originated with Samuel Butler in 1863 when he wrote his essay, Darwin Among the Machines. This was only shortly after the origin of species. Um, he subsequently wrote a book, well, let me just say that he pointed out, in a sense maybe now it's obvious, but that technology undergoes descent with modification and selection, which is the essence of what Darwin said evolution was about. And um, he went on to write a, a remarkable novel, Irwan, uh, in 1872. And in this novel, he imagines technology competing with humanity. He says, in the course of the ages, we shall find ourselves the inferior race. Now, I'm not going to stress that at all. Uh, in fact, I tend to believe much more in the vision of Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, who um, envisioned biology, technology, and culture being united in something he called the noosphere, which evolving through time, influencing each other, um, but in he imagined a very harmonious way. Now, Teilhard de Chardin was a Jesuit priest, and um, he, he also imagined technology going towards something he called the omega point, uh, where everything is somehow great at the end of, of, uh, of the evolution of, of the noosphere. I, I, I think that's also perhaps a bit naive, and perhaps the future lies somewhere between the tension of um, of uh, Samuel Butler and Teilhard de Chardin. Um, now, I think it's worth commenting a bit on both the similarities and differences between biological and technological evolution. Um, if you want to see more on this, you can see the review paper that with Ricard Soleil in, that was published in Complexity uh, a couple of years ago. Um, similarities are that, as I've already mentioned, both are driven by selection. We select the technologies that we find useful or that, for whatever reason, we find attractive. Um, both processes generate enormous amounts of diversity that's selected for through processes of incremental and not so incremental variation. There's a temporal progression of technologies through time. 
as there is in biology, and units function in purposeful ways, um, as, they, as they do in biology. Differences are manifest that uh, in biology, organisms reproduce themselves unless they're viruses, or it's not a universal rule by any means, um, versus artificial manufacture. We make technologies, although they play an integral role in making themselves. Um, uh, biology proceeds through a process of random variation, whereas technologies come about through a process of conscious design. Now I'm going to present you a model for technological evolution that blurs that distinction rather strikingly. I think it can be overrated. Um, um, biology, biological organisms are organized on a microscopic scale. Um, whereas technology is organized on a macroscopic scale. That is, technology, as I'll argue, is distributed throughout the planet. Things are made in different places. Things are assembled from parts made all over the world. And so it's a very distributed process that leads to technology. Um, innovation in technology is much more like what in biology is called horizontal gene transfer. This is something that happens in bacteria, where bacteria, when they um, uh, have sex, do so in a, 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 a quite a different way than, than, say, mammals. They can literally pick out parts of each other's genome and breed in a selective fashion. And as a consequence, um, it's much harder to organize bacteria into a tree. When you think about taxonomies of bacteria, they aren't trees. They're rather much more complicated graphs that can have cycles and um, the story is much more complicated. And similarly, this inhibits us really understanding the origins of technology. Um, so now, I'm going to now move to a somewhat more practical motivation for my talk, what drives economic growth. In 1956, Robert Solow showed that if you look at history of growth through time, that investment can explain it, and technological progress has to be the dominant cause. Now, in the way Solo looked at technology, and in fact, in the way economists look at technology through to the present, technology just appears as some factor A, a number, which is a function of time in a Cobb-Douglas production function. So it's a very simple notion of technology. Um, there is, in, in modern growth theory, there can be feedback, you can, this, num this total factor of productivity, A of T, um, can change endogenously through interactions, but it's nonetheless just a view of that technology is somehow just a number. All the technology on the earth is reduced to uh, just one number, the total factor of productivity. Now, um, Nate Rosenberg, for many years, pointed out that if we really want to understand technology, we have to get inside the black box. We have to describe Technology is more than just a single number. And in recent years, Brian Arthur has emphasized the role of combination and, um, and technologies as re being recursively constructed out of themselves. So I'm going to very much follow that, um, that perspective. Um, but if we really want to understand economic growth, the point of this motivational slide is we have to understand we need a predictive theory. So we're, we're, I'm going to try in this talk illustrate a few first steps towards doing such a thing. Now, I want to begin, also I want to make an observation here that um, some goods drop in price much faster than others. Now, this can be motivated in part by something called the Prebisch and Singer hypothesis in 1950. Prebisch and Singer both hypothesized that commodities drop in price faster than technologies. In doing this, they were worried about uh, difficulties in growth for developing countries, because developing countries often depend on commodities, like agricultural products or minerals, as a primary component of their, of their exports. And um, so he, they worried that if indeed commodities are falling in price faster than technologies through time, developing countries would be disadvantaged and growth would be very difficult for these countries. Um, now, Prebisch and Singer hypothesis has undergone a lot of debate uh, since 1950. And the evidence weighs in that there's a very slight effect 
to say that they were right. That is, if you analyze enough data and you construct indices, you can see that commodities do appear to drop in price a little bit faster than technologies. But our argument from looking at a lot of data is that that's not the main event. That's not the main part of the story. And in fact, to, think of, to, to get the main part of the story, you have to look at the variation in prices uh, of commodities versus technologies. So in this slide here, I show, um, I'm not quite sure how many, 12 or 15 different commodities. Um, and you can see that starting in 1960, where we normalize them all so they have price one, and then look at their variation through time, uh, well, we do see variation, but that variation is, I will argue, rather small. That is, at the end of the period, 60 years later, um, the technology, the commodity that's gone up the most in price has gone up less than a factor of three. The one that's dropped the most in price has dropped by less than a factor of two. That is, the variation is not large. Um, we've made a more um, substantial study of this. This, this slide is done with Wolfgang Riedlinger, uh, looking at um, mineral prices since 1900. So now we're talking about more than a century of variation in mineral prices. And so we plot in log base 10 on the y-axis, we plot the maximum and minimum over a set of more than 100 minerals taken from the USGS website. And we look at their prices. And you see in the top red panel the, the, the commodity, that the, the maximum price as a function of time. You see the minimum price out of this set of more than 100 commodity or minerals as a function of time. And once again, you see surprisingly little variation, um, significantly less than a factor of 10 variation across these commodities. Now, in contrast, let's look at technologies. Um, so here we see several technologies that we've chosen. Um, the longest record starts in 1960. And we look, at, we look to the present. And we see, on one hand, some technologies like airfares up at the top that have dropped in price surprisingly little. In contrast, if you look at transistors in blue here, during this period of time, transistors have dropped in price by a factor of 10 to the 8. And that's a lot, far more than any commodities. And, and when you compare the two, you see that technologies, which are shown in blue, versus commodities shown in red, some of the technologies have undergone dramatic drops in cost during a remarkably short period of time. Now let me say, for the technologies, we've selected these. We've selected technologies that are the ones that have undergone a drop in cost. On the other hand, we've been searching for commodities that have behaved similarly, and we have not found any. In the USGS mineral site, we at first thought we had a, a, a mineral that had seemed to have dropped dramatically in cost, but then we looked to see what it was. Well, it was industrial diamonds. Industrial diamonds are manufactured. They're not dug out of the ground. Now, it's a bit of a mystery why this difference should be as it is, given that commodities depend heavily on technology. The technology for mining things is, um, has, has progressed dramatically. Now, you could argue, well, that the reason for this is because um, commodities have gotten scarcer through time, um, or minerals, for example, in the previous slide. But somehow it seems strange that it sh the increase in scarcity should balance so dramatically or so, 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 so clearly against the advances in technology. And so I think there's something else going on. But I don't think this is well understood. Now, I want to make one more motivational slide to talk a little bit about the consequences of this kind of thing for public investment. So in particular, um, we know that because of um, climate change, we really need to um, move to green, ener green energy. That is, we need to move to sources of energy that don't emit CO2 and other greenhouse gases. Now, so we have to make a choice about um, which sources of energy we're going to get our power from. And in this slide, um, I'm contrasting three different sources of energy. So on one, on one hand, um, I don't know if I have, I'm just going to point at the screen. On one hand, we have, I'm showing here the price of coal. Now, so this is actually the coal fuel price for electricity generation. 
The total price for generating electricity from coal is a mixture of the cost of building the plant, the cost of operating and maintaining the plant, and the raw cost of buying the coal. Here I'm just looking at the cost of coal because I want to make a point. Coal, the cost of the coal is around 40% of the operating of, of the cost of generating electricity from coal. And the striking thing that you see when you look in this picture, where we're looking now the price for electricity in dollars per kilowatt hour, um, and <clears throat> we're looking at the contribution to coal, which is about 40%. So it's a couple of cents per kilowatt hour that we, we pay for buying the coal to make electricity. You can see that through 150 years, um, the coal fuel price has varied by um, less than a factor of three. That is, people make a lot of noise, of course, when prices go up or down. But when you actually look at this time series, I would argue the variation is not much. And in fact, if you fit a time series model to, to coal, what you see is you get a random walk without drift. That is, you cannot reject what's called the unit root hypothesis. Um, and to first approximation, coal fuel price looks like a random walk. Now, um, I'll compare to another source of, of electricity, in this case, nuclear power. So these red triangles represent the nuclear power plants that, um, that's, this is the pointer up there, okay. These represents the nuclear power plants that came online in the United States. Uh, so these are all the nuclear power plants where the red triangle indicates the cost of the electricity at the time the plant came online. And the date is the time the plant came online. Now, this is a bit of a complicated data set because there's a strong selection bias. As we know, nuclear power plants have come under a lot of scrutiny for safety measures. Um, and so actually, the last plant to come online here, as I recall, took 23 years from the initiation to the time it came online, introducing a selection effect. But nonetheless, what you see during this period is the cost of the electricity has actually increased over this period. It certainly has not gone down. Now, in contrast, in green, I show you the cost of a solar energy module as a function of time. And I show the price in dollars per watt peak. Now, so in other words, you should look this direction for the units for solar energy. Why am I doing that? Because solar energy in Singapore um, is much more effective than, say, solar energy in the United Kingdom, where I, I flew from a few days ago when it was raining, as it has been for the last two months, um, uh, pretty much without stopping. Um, so it's very hard to generate, oops, darn it, very hard to generate solar energy this time of year. But so anyway, we, we show the price in, in dollars per watt peak. So this is the cost of producing a photovoltaic module that when the sun is shining on it can produce a watt. And what you see is the price has dropped dramatically. In fact, since solar photovoltaic uh, technology was invented in the 1950s, roughly at the same time that nuclear power was invented, the cost has dropped by about a factor of 5,000, quite dramatically. So it's one of the rapidly improving technologies. And I've tried to normalize the graph here by setting things so that, because we, we either have to measure, the, the, the right way to measure price for any given application is in dollars per kilowatt hour, which takes into account things like the cost of capital for the investment, the distribution cost for installation, lots of complicated factors that can be location specific um, or, and time specific versus just the raw cost of building the modules. In just to set the reference frame for 2012, the most recent installed photovoltaic plant, and this is a commercial scale farm, not just putting something on somebody's roof, the cost came in at about 28 cents per kilowatt hour. So I normalized this scale and this scale by, or calibrated the two scales based on that data point. Now, you'll notice that if we make an extrapolation by just drawing a line through these points, we end up crossing nuclear power here in about 2021. This, this cross, by the way, is the, for the Hinkley Point plant, which is a plant that uh, UK has just decided to build. Um, the cost of the electricity will be subsidized. China, by the way, owns a significant fraction of this, will own a significant fraction of this plant. Uh, interesting uh, evidence of globalization. And um, 
But the crossover point is that around, at around the time the plant will get built, um, the cost will be comparable. And here I've shown the, what I'm calling the DOE sunshot target, that at around this cost here, five cents per kilowatt hour, solar energy will be competitive with coal. Now notice this happens in around 2030. So the point is this. If you're a government making investments, I would argue you need to take history into account by thinking about in, in understanding what's going to happen in the future. Because as I will argue, what investments are made determine the rate at which one moves down this curve, the rate at which this crossover happens. And when you have a technology that's improving at a dramatic way, rate, the, the net present value for investing in that technology can become positive well before, um, uh, well before the, the technology becomes competitive at the margin. Okay, so another motivational slide. Now, I'm gonna move on to the next part of my talk and say some things about empirical laws for technological improvement. This is one of the things that gets, got me interested in thinking about this at all, because as a physicist, you're attracted by regularities in the world. And there's some striking unexplained regularities about the way technology improves. Um, the story begins with what I'm going to call Wright's Law. And this is um, Theodore Paul Wright. It's a very interesting guy. He was a brother of um, Sewell Wright, who is a famous evolutionary biologist. Um, and now I always forget the first name of his other brother, who was considered one of the founders of political science. He was the black sheep of the family who, instead of becoming an academic, uh, became a pilot and was a World War I flying ace um, and came back to the United States and got heavily involved in the avi aviation industry. But in 1936, he wrote a short paper pointing out that if you plot um, the cost of airplanes as a function of the number of airplanes, cumulative number of airplanes produced, that it tends to come down as a power law and a power law with the property that every time you double the cumulative production, the cost drops by about 20%. Now, Wright, by the way, went on to become um, head of aviation manufacturer for the United States during World War II and actually used this law in order to forecast what airplane production was going to cost as the war was evolving. Um, now, I show you here some data for Wright's law. So we see, because, because let me just make the comment that Wright's law, it turns out holds not just, originally he imagined it for a specific product from a specific factory and looking at the cost through time. Since then, people have plotted the data in more general ways, including looking at whole tech, the cost of technologies through time, regardless of where they're produced, and <clears throat> oftentimes looking at different technologies, even though they're not exactly the same. And I'll uh, say some more about that and then say some of the problems with this idea. So here we see Wright's law for ethanol. So we're now plotting the average unit price in real dollars here on logarithmic scale against the cumulative production in terms of number of units also on logarithmic scale. So we see, for instance, transistors here where we have cumulative production has uh, gone through a factor of 10 to the 10. So we have an enormous number of transistors being produced in the world. Um, we see here uh, photovoltaics, which I've already mentioned up here, um, hard disk drives, and ethanol. And depending on how picky you are, um, Wright's Law seems like a fairly good relationship. Um, now, just a cautionary remark. It's necessary to think about Wright's Law to find units of something that are more or less comparable. So a good example occurs uh, if you look at, say, Ford's Model T. So here we plot the cost of producing the Model T in thousands of dollars against the cumulative number of units produced. Now, it's worth noting that in 1909, Ford announced, I am going to make a car the common man can afford. At the time, the automobile was a luxury item. So, he worked at it, and from 1909 all the way through 1926, um, he made the Model T and with the goal of making the cars all exactly the same. 
Now, I actually, a few summers ago, I happened to bump into a Model T club at the Great Sand Dunes Park in Colorado. And so they had about 15 or 20 Model Ts, and they actually aren't all exactly the same. He did make some changes in the Model T as he went along, but they were pretty close to the same. And, and so cost was the sole object of improvement, and indeed we see the cost came down. And until finally in 1927, I believe it was, Ford announced, I have now made a car the common man can afford. I am going to concentrate on making better cars. And when you look at that, what you see is once he started making better cars, the cost of cars went back up again. So the car itself is not a reasonable unit. Now, bear that in mind. Um, now, there's another even more famous law for technological progress, and that's Moore's law. Now, Moore originally hypothesized in 1965 that um, transistor density would double um, every, uh, as I recall, every two years. Uh, it got adjusted later on. One was 18 months, one was two years, and I forget which, which is which now. Um, so indeed we see that the density of transistors, the transistor count in a given, in a given area is going up exponentially through time. Um, now, that's, by the way, data co courtesy of Gordon Moore himself. Now, in this slide, I plotted the same data that we had for the same technologies, but now I plotted it in terms of Moore's law. That is, instead of plotting the log of cumulative production on the x-axis, I'm now just plotting time, and we're plotting the average unit pl price on the y-axis. And once again, you can, you can ask yourself, to what extent uh, is this law holding? And I would say it's not bad. Although it's interesting to note that if you look at, well, what I would call generalized Moore's law, because now, note, we're not plotting the density of transistors, we're plotting the cost of making a transistor as a function of time. It's also coming down exponentially with the same doubling time. But, um, but we can compare to, to Wright's law. So now when I flip back and forth between the two of these plots, this is Moore's law where time is on the x-axis. This, oops is Wright's law, where log of cumulative production is on the x-axis, you see that actually there's a better fit for Moore's law to Wright's law than vice versa. That is, this produces a nicer plot. Um, now, um, turns out these things are, in some sense, compatible. In some sense, they're compatible, and in some sense, they're very different. That is, if... Um, if you also postulate that production increases exponentially, and here I show these same four technologies, I show production of them through time, that is how many units have been produced as a function of time, the log of the number of units being produced as a function of time, we roughly speaking see straight lines. And if you now put these two facts together, as was originally noted by Sahal in 1987, and though we only found this much later after we'd done this, um, you see that Sahal pointed out a very trivial thing, that if production's increasing exponentially with time, and if cost is dropping exponentially with time, and you just eliminate time, then you get cost uh, dropping as a power law of cumulative production. So the two laws are compatible through a, tr through a fairly trivial mechanism. And indeed, if you compare, on one hand, fitting exponentials B and A, uh, to under the assumptions of exponential increase in production, exponential decrease in cost, versus um, fittings Wright's law, looking at, at um, um, cost dropping as a power law of production, you see all the data. These are all different technologies here clustered along the identity line. The prediction is pretty good. Now, I show here a picture of my colleague, Bela Naj, who was the lead author on the paper where we did this. Um, there's a bit of a strange story. Bela, uh, discovered this work by Sahal, and we tried to track Sahal down and discovered that Sahal had disappeared in about um, 1990. And Bela actually managed to get in touch with Sahal's brother. He said, well, you know, we don't know. He just disappeared and um, vanished without a trace. And so Bela was quite obsessed with this, and oddly enough, about a year and a half ago, Bela disappeared. And he actually disappeared in Singapore. The last place that he was seen was Singapore. So um, 
I don't know. If you, if you see him walking down the street, tell him I say hi. Because uh, I miss him. I miss him. He was a great collaborator. Um, okay. Strange story. Um, now, um, uh, so I'm going to begin, I'm going to make a, a, a bold hypothesis, and then we're going to explore the, the consequences of this bold hypothesis. The bold hypothesis is that all technologies obey the sandum, the same random process for improvement. That is, the parameters may vary across technologies, but let's just assume there's some random process like Moore's Law or Wright's Law that allows us to think about how these technologies improve in time, and let's explore where that goes. So we're going to fit time series models. Um, as was mentioned, I've been working on time series models for a long time. We're going to fit very simple vanilla time series models to these things because we don't have that much data. And that kind of constrains what we can do. So we're first of all going to rewrite Moore's Law as a random walk with drift. So that is the generalized Moore's Law. We can rewrite as, it's actually I should say it's a geometric random walk with drift because we're going to look at the change in the logarithm of the cost. So if yt is the logarithm of the cost, we look at the change in the logarithm of the cost. And that's equal to some factor mu, which is a drift term that tells us the background rate at which things are improving, plus some noise term where n of t is some uh, zero mean uh, variance one noise process and k is a parameter that tells us how noisy this particular technological process is going to be. So we let technologies differ in two ways. One is the rate at which they improve as characterized by mu and the noise with which that improvement happens. Some technologies we will see are inherently noisier than others. Um, then we also rewrite Wright's Law as a random walk with drift that's dependent on the cumulative production. So once again, we look at the change in the logarithm of the cost, which we now write as some parameter w times the logarithm of um, the cost at time t, or the cumulative production at time t plus 1 divided by the cumulative production at time t, again, plus some uh, mean 0 variance 1 noise process times some factor that has to do with how noisy the process is. And what we're going to do now is compare how these two time series models um, fit the data and, most importantly, how well they do at predicting what happens in the data. So we do this through method of hindcasting, which is a special case of what's called cross-validation. Um, here are my collaborators on doing this. Um, we've, we're doing this, by the way, based on data that um, Bela gathered for a, a study that we've done and that we've enhanced a little bit since then, but substantially was gathered by data by Bela and a team of volunteers. Um, so <clears throat> how does this work? We pretend to be at a given time in the past. We use a given method, in this case, either Wright's Law or Moore's Law to forecast each future year. We repeat that for all past dates. We score the methods based on their forecasting errors. And as I already said, we make the hypothesis that the improvement process is the same for all technologies except for their parameters. So, we take a, a time series like this one. So we see the time series here for um, photovoltaics from uh, 1980 to 2011. And we look at the logarithm of cost on this axis against time. So this is for Moore's Law. We look at the same time series here, except now it's being plotted as a function of cumulative production. And we just do something very simple. We walk through, we take some set of points, which in this case, just for illustrative purposes, I'll assume we just take the six most recent points, we fit the parameters of our model based on those points, and then we forecast future values, and we look at the discrepancy between the real data and the forecast data, we accumulate those, and then compare them. So we just walk through like this, making forecasts at each reference point um, using both methods, so the forecasts are shown in green, compare those to the actual data, and we look at how well we do. Now you can see there are some places where, at least with this method, where we're not using very much past history, we're going to get wildly wrong forecasts because there's lots of little bumps and wiggles in these time series. In the PV data series, for example, there was a global shortage of silicon crystals in this period, which is why things get so flat around this period. The Chinese enter the game and start um, uh, dramatically supporting 
photovoltaic manufacturer apparently trying to corner the market and drive the cost down dramatically. But we're focused on the long range trend that is we're trying to understand the overall rate of improvement across a long span of time, and which as I already mentioned, uh, drops by a factor of 5,000 in since it's the, the initiation of this technology. So we then compare the errors of the two methods. And so in this plot here, we see the, some normalized errors. So we do this by dividing by either K or S, the normalization constants for the noise, to allow us to, comp to compare different technologies. And we look at the normalized error using Wright's law to forecast versus the normalized error using Moore's law for forecast. And we see that most of the time, the, the results are fairly tightly clustered along the identity line here. Um, but there are some technologies where Moore's law makes fairly dramatic errors and Wright's law does pretty well. And there are more like that than there are of the other variety. And so in fact, what we see is that on average, at longer time horizons that um, Wright's law, shown in red, beats Moore's law, shown in black. Now, um, I should note that really I have to be a little careful when I state this result because although I'm plotting this as a function of the horizon measured in years, for Wright's law, what we do is we assume that we know the future cumulative production. So we say if the cumulative production is what it turned out to be in such and such a year, what will the cost be? So really what we're doing here is we're, we're comparing the forecast value of knowing the future production with the forecast value of knowing the time. And in fact, if we force ourselves to first forecast the production at a given point in time and then forecast the cost, the two come out about the same. Now, um, and th this, let me explain now why I think this is important. So um, I already said Wright's law is better. B Wright's law based on production forecast better than Moore's law based on time. Um, the suggestion from that is that costs can be driven down by stimulating production through things like feed-in tariffs. That is, if the causality says that if you just increase production, costs will come down, then you can actually, if you're a government, do things like introduce a feed-in tariff, as Germany has, as actually most states in the United States have, to subsidize um, photovoltaic power in order to, quote, bring it down the learning curve and reduce, reduce costs. But the skeptic would argue, well, how do we know that production, is production driving costs down or is cost driving production up? That is, it's quite plausible to say what really happens is that things evolve towards um, to become cheaper. Once they become cheaper, demand goes up and people buy more. And so maybe it's actually the drop in cost that's driving the cost in production. Now, we've been looking for data on artificial experiments, such as World War II, to test this properly. That is, we know in World War II, where the United States went from having the 13th largest army in the world, that is, a very small army, to producing two thirds of all military equipment produced in the war on either side, um, that it wasn't that they said, oh, gee, tanks are getting cheaper. Let's build a lot of them. Um, it was very clear. They said, we are going to build tanks no matter what. And so we've been collecting data to try and tease out the causality. And indeed, what I, sh I show you an example here. This is, this is not ready. Uh, we, we, we have not fully digested this data yet, and we're in, still in the process of collecting the data. But this is uh, one of the famous Liberty ships where um, shipyards were mass producing ships. Um, and what we see is as a function of the cumulative production of ships, the man hours per ship come down. Similarly, when you look at this, you see the cost per ship coming down. This is despite the fact that these were all funded on a cost plus basis. So the manufacturers actually had little direct incentive to bring the cost down, other than it might help them get the next contract. But um, so we see that, that things tend to tilt on that side. Now, now um, let me just point out that then Moore's law versus Wright's law is actually quite different because Moore's law says that technology just improves inexorably. Regardless of what we do, technology will get cheaper. Wright's law says technology improves because we build more of it. That focuses more attention of it. There could be a lot of different causes. It could be because 
we learn how to make things better. It could be because we have just raw economies of scale. We make the factories bigger. Making the factories bigger automatically brings the cost down, say if it's a chemical plant, brings it down automatically just from things like surface to volume ratios. So there are many factors, but the difference is between was it stimulated by production or is it inexorable? And uh, if we're right and Wright's law is, uh, the causality is going as we think that cost drives production down, then that really says that governments can make a difference by stimulating technologies to bring them down the learning curve. And I'll come back and say more about that a bit later in my talk. Now, um, now one can then ask, well, why should Wright's law be true? So I'm now going to describe you uh, uh, some work I've done on a theoretical paper. Um, but first, I want to mention that things like, like Wright's law pop up elsewhere. So for example, in 1936, Blackburn, who was a psychologist, who was studying how long does it take for um, two different subjects, in this case S1 and S2, to perform um, sums. So he would give them numbers to add by hand, old-fashioned addition, and time how long it took them to get the answer, and then track the subject through time. And subjects were obviously fairly patient people because he had them perform these sums 10,000 times. And what you see is when you plot this data on log-log scale, and this is from his 1936 paper, that both subjects come down as a power law with roughly the same slope. One of them seems to be intrinsically better at it than the other one because their times are consistently lower. But um, they nonetheless both lie on a similar curve. In psychology, this is called the power law of practice. And it's a fairly well substantiated um, law in psychology. So, that's suggestive. Maybe there's something about learning. Maybe the learning that's going on in these people's brains is similar to the institutional learning that's going on when, um, when an airplane is being manufactured. Maybe. Now, so uh, we worked on a model for this uh, that was inspired by the following two models. One is by Muth on a paper from Management Science in 1987 where he made a very simple model. He just assumes that Engineers generate solutions at random. They throw darts at a dartboard. What engineers are smart enough to know how to do is recognize that one dart is to the left or right of another dart. That is, they can tell when they have something that's better than something else. They can tell when the cost has come down. And that's, that's all they do. So, and he imagined a technology that had a single component, so you didn't have to worry about the interactions of the components with each other. The engineers just threw a dart every day, and, and if they happened to get a better throw, they, they, they picked it. And what you can show is that when you do that, the, um, and, you, and if you assume a uniform distribution in the dart throws, that you can show that you get Wright's law with an exponent minus one. That is, the progress ratio, it's called, is 100%. Um, that is, every time, well, let, let me state this this way. Every time you double production, the cost comes down by a factor of two. Um, so now, this, this was expanded on by Auerswald, Kaufman, Lobo, and Shell in 2000 in a model that extended what Muth had done to assume that you had multiple components that depended on each other. And the difference now is you have the engineers in one part of the factory and the engineers in a different part of the factory, and I think I have a slide over here showing this idea, who um, interact through something called a design structure matrix. So this is the design structure matrix for a laptop computer. So you've got the drive system, the main board, LCD screen, the packaging, and then there's subcomponents within each of these categories, and the same categories are up here. Uh, and then you make an X if, if a given system is interacting with another system. Now you see the somewhat block diagonal structure. Things on the main board are more likely to interact with each other than they are likely to interact with the packaging. But this gives you a matrix of the interactions. Now, in the recipe model, the engineers have to coordinate. So the engineers in, say, this unit throw their darts, and, uh, and the engineers in, well, let me, let me pick a better example. The engineers in the, um, uh, where would this be? This would be in the, in the main board, so whatever this first, 
this technology and the main board system are, throw their darts. The engineers over here in packaging throw their darts. They only get to accept the improvement if the sum of their scores is better than it was before. So they're, now their performance is coupled. They have to coordinate. So under this simple model, um, Lobo and Kaufman and Shell showed simulations that indicated that, well, it kind of looked like a power law, but slopes seemed to depend to vary, and, and even the smoothness which, with, with which the improvement happened varied. So what we did was to solve their model, and um, we were able to actually show that it generates a power law with an exponent that's, that is given by this number, minus 1 over d where D is what we call the design complexity, which it depends on the design structure matrix. Now, if you make this um, design structure matrix in a homogeneous way um, so that um, the degree, uh, that is, the number of components that depend on each other is constant and not varying, that if you do that, we could show that it's the, the power law has exponent exactly minus 1 over d, where d is the number of components that are connected together. In general, it's actually more complicated than that because you can get bottlenecks because you have diversity, and it turns out the, the couplings, the things that are most coupled together can create bottlenecks that inhibit everything else. Um, so the, the full story is a bit more complicated. Now, in this plot, I... I show you the kind of results we're getting where we look in one hand, we look at a particular design structure matrix that we make up. So we imagine some components are just along the diagonal, but others are coupled. And we now simulate this model across um, for a very long time with this design structure matrix. And in the color code here, what you see is the probability of different trajectories of improvement through time where I show you a couple of examples of improvement trajectories here, and you see something, we, we, we were quite surprised to see it actually, which is that we spontaneously get um, punctuated equilibria coming out of this very simple model. And the punctuated equilibria, to see what I mean by that, well, you can see there's a period where improvement is fairly slow and steady, and then there's a dramatic improvement here, and then there's a long plateau where the system's just stuck, and then it suddenly improves, and it gets stuck again, and then it suddenly improves, and so forth. Now, it turns out the reason for these plateaus are the bottlenecks that I described. It hits one of these bottlenecks, and things just get stuck for a long time. Then finally, you have the key innovation that gets you out of the bottleneck. Though That combination of engineers manages to get their darts to get an improvement, and when they improve, this is not actually just one time step. What happens is you see a cascade of improvements that are then enabled by the improvement that just happened and until the system gets stuck again. Um, so while on average there's a kind of a smooth band for improvement, all the individual trajectories in this case look very jumpy and we were able to characterize when you would have punctuated equilibria and when you weren't based on the properties of the design structure matrix. Um, now, let me just say that while I'm very proud of this paper and I think it was a nice model, you know, it's the kind of thing we need to do. I just think it's a part of the story. Um, for one thing, this model assumes that you can just think about a given plant, like the plant that's making the PC, and ignore the rest of the technological universe. That's not the way it works at all. We know that innovations in one industry often drive innovations in others, and in fact, for so solar photovoltaics, Greg Nimmit showed that if you decompose the cost of improvement, one of the main drivers of improvement was silicon crystals, which was being driven significantly piggybacking on the um, computer industry, where the, the same technologies, there's enough, enough similarities and cross-fertilization between um, wafers that are used for um, computers and those used for um, solar cells that, that th those, those improvements just, just crossed over. Um, so these interactions between technologies are key, and we have to model the evolution of the entire technological ecology to understand a single technology. Um, now I want to make one other comment before I go forward and talk about the steps we're making towards doing that now. Um, in particular, 
I want to just emphasize that physics matters to economics and in particular to technological improvement. Um, as I've already tried to stress, some technologies improve a lot faster than others. Um, there is a close interaction between the physics, which determines what's possible, and economics, which determines what people actually want. Um, and in particular, let me just, uh, Jeffrey Funk, who is at the other university, the uh, National University of Singapore, has, and Chris McGee, who is at the uh, Singapore University for Technological Design, yes. So they've, they've been working on trying to really, as we are, collect historical data, parse out what are the determinants of improvement, and they've argued that physics is really the key thing you need to think about. And in particular, um, well, the most dramatic improvement we've seen is that in the integrated circuit business where um, there have just been these automatic economies of scale, but economies of small scale coming along. Every time you make something smaller, you automatically make it faster and more energy efficient and cheaper all at the same time. And so these, you've had huge improvements just coming along kind of automatically. And, um, and, and we've argued that this results in a kind of migration towards a good physics. And you look, if you look at the network structure, and I'll, I'll say a bit more about this in a minute. Now I want to just um, hark back to some early work that was done uh, um, I and others did um, now more than tw 20 or 30 years ago, um, both at Los Alamos and at the Santa Fe Institute. Um, in particular, a model that we, we made for autocatalytic metabolisms. An autocatalytic metabolism, and, I wanna, and why am I talking about this? Because I want to argue that this is actually closely analogous to technological improvement and thinking about technological improvement in an ecological systems way. Um, so, and, and autocatalytic metabolism is a set of chemical species that jointly produce each other via catalyzed chemical reactions involving only other members of the set. And <clears throat> we worked on this at the time as a possible model for the origin of proto-life. That is, before there was life as we know it with DNA, there, we argued there must have been um, a rich soup of of, of complex um, molecules that gave rise to modern life. And so we wrote a series of papers on metadynamics, and uh, these papers were all with Norman Packard, or the concept evolved with Norman Packard, in which we, we formulated the idea of a dynamical system model that happens on a dynamic network. So you have something like a set of chemical reactions. The network is determined by the set of chemicals that are actually present in the soup, but Spontaneous new reactions can, get, can create new chemical species that were previously not in the soup. When that happens, the network changes, and now the chemical kinetics change, and the set of differential equations that you need to characterize what's going on changes. Um, um, so and as a result, we get evolution towards the adjacent possible. And in particular, so we wrote a series of papers on this. Um, including both autocatalytic replication for polymers, but also modeling the immune system. And um, so the idea was like this. We have species like A and B. Think of these as um, uh, basic atoms, if you will. And they form in, into molecules like AA and BB, AAA, et cetera. And, and so we can now make a kind of mandala that shows us the set of all possibilities as we go outwards towards species of ever-increasing length. And we get a, rea a reaction network that might look like this, where we see the reactions shown in solid. So for example, um, um, AABAA joins with AA to create AAAABAA, et cetera. And these dashed lines are the catalytics, the catalytic relationships. So this molecule here catalyzes this reaction, and as we create spontaneous new reactions, they may catalyze other reactions, and if they catalyze these other reactions, the rates are vastly higher, and you can see sudden dramatic increases in the uh, set of species occupying the pot. Um, now, so we were able to simulate this kind of model in which we start with a simple food set, we implement the chemical kinetics, 
We define the shadow set as the species that can be reached by uncatalyzed reactions within the network. We create new species from this shadow set with some probability that depends on the reaction rates. And then if we add a new catalyzed reaction, we install it in the network, and that alters the set of reactions that we have there. Um, so this is actually from Rick Bagley's thesis, where you see the initial set of uncatalyzed, what happens if you don't have any catalyzed reactions, and you're just sitting at equilibrium without any driving, and then you begin driving the system away from equilibrium, and we now see the, and now you should picture the, now did I have the, no, wait a minute, I'm going to go back to this picture. So you should imagine what you're seeing, take this mandala, rotate it down so it's sitting horizontally in the plane, and you're now looking at the concentrations of the chemical species coming vertically out of the plane. And so, so you now see that initially you have a very boring homogeneous network where as you go from small species, short polymers to long polymers, the concentration's just following off exponentially as you go to things of increasing length. But when you actually simulate an evolving network of this type, you can see some polymers emerging at concentrations that are much higher than the background and driving it still further away from equilibrium. There's a few specific polymers that occur at very high concentration in the soup. That is, we, we have at least a, a, a theoretical conceptual proof of principle that we could have um, such a rich soup of, of a few chemical species in the background reactions. Now, um, we were able to then go on to show with a paper that also included Walter Plantana as an author um, that um, we could vary the food set and these, these, these autocatalytic sets could often change what it was they were actually digesting and create, um, survive, even though we were changing their food set on them. And they could evolve through time as um, new species would get created through evolutionary variation. And now, we're working on a model that is in many senses uh, similar to that model, um, where we, we're building on Leontief model for an economy in which nodes are industries, weighted directed links are the inputs to each industry. Um, you can do this based on physical flows or on monetary flows of specific goods. The equations that you get when you do this are actually in precise analogy to equilibrium chemical kinetics. Uh, and one, in fact, can write down non-equilibrium versions of those. And you have conservation laws in this case of of mass, literally of mass, that lead to linear systems of equations. And these were widely used in national accounting and central planning, although not as popular today, I would say, as they once were. Now, in this picture, I show you a uh, picture of the um, US industry network at a resolution of about 40 industries from James McNerney's thesis. And um, you see how different industries interact with each other via their input and output relationships. Now again, the basic idea here is that this is a bit like the autocatalytic network where improvements in one technology can um, drive improvements in other technologies and to really think about the to any specific technology, you need to think about the whole web of technologies that influence that technology. Um, so in particular, we argued that um, design improvement happens through input tuning, through substitution of cheaper or better inputs, through creation of new goods, network growth, through improved social technologies of production and distribution that unfortunately we can't see in the Leontief network, and also through the increase in combinatorial possibilities. The palette through time gets larger and more powerful and something that Brian has emphasized. Um, now I want to make a comment about um, looping back in such a model to, to how competing technologies um, uh, affect each other and how technologies can get stuck and why the technological search space is a complex, rugged landscape with many local minima and a high degree of path dependence. Um, so in this plot, I've shown the trajectory of an old technology on Wright's law, where we assume we have, I should have said, the logarithm of unit cost here, 
and as before, the logarithm of cumulative production here. And so we see the cost coming down through time and or, or through as cumulative production increases so that this old dominant technology is sitting at this particular point. Now we imagine a new technology that enters over here. So in this case, I'm going to let it enter at a lower initial cost. I'm going to let it come down at the same rate. And I'm not arguing that's necessarily the way things happen. But, um, and, but we're asking now, what, um, uh, how does this new technology ever, which has greater potential and, and for what can reach a given unit cost with a much smaller level of cumulative production, how does that ever beat the old technology? Because at the margin, if you're a company um, that has to make a profit <coughs> and you're, you're choosing between these two, unless there's some kind of government pressure or some other reason, you're going to choose this every time. Because at the margin, this is cheaper. On the other hand, if you're a government, it, as I already mentioned, it may be worthwhile to try and invest to actually bring it through this threshold where it's, where it's to, so they can beat the pre-existing technology. And this investment may actually have net present value. But without something like a government bringing this along down the learning curve, this may never happen. This technology could easily get stuck. So if you take a technology like photovoltaics, on one hand, they've evolved through as occupying a series of specialized niches. Photovoltaic um, power was invented for satellites because in space we needed, we needed a way to power uh, the, ele the electronics in a satellite. Um, it, it then found applications at places like polar research stations, uh, place, remote places out in the jungle. Then at a certain point, people started to use it even for things like uh, in, in cities and for lights for um, parking lots and things like that. And, but nonetheless, it's in danger of getting stuck at any point in time because without investment, it may never be able to make its way all the way down the learning curve. Now, um, so we've been looking at fluctuations in the input-output matrix for the USA, and so we compare here two years, 2002 and 1997, and we plot on the x-axis the logarithm of the weight of the money flow for an, that's for an input to an industry, and there's 480 industries in this plot. Um, so we have a 480 by 480 set of possible inputs. Most of those inputs, by the way, are, are not very big. Most of them are very close to zero. And so we plot that on the x-axis, and we plot the logarithm. So you can see there's quite a wide variation from uh, zero. This is an input that's dominating to minus 6 indicates an input that's only 1 millionth of the total. Now we plot that against the logarithm of the 2002 minus the 1997 input that is, the ratio, since logarithms have the property that the log of the ratio is equal to the difference of the logs, so it's the log of the fractional change in the input. And what we see that we found quite surprising is this clear pattern where the largest inputs change fractionally by relatively less than the smallest inputs, which can change quite dramatically by factors of 100 or 1,000 or even 10,000. And so we've been trying to characterize this pattern and understand its implications. And um, we see that actually we can take slices, oops, slices through this picture. And when we slice these and we renormalize them, we see fairly similar looking distributions. Um, this is the overall distribution for the input. And we've made a model in which we take just one of the causes of improvement that I outlined before that is efficiency improvements. And so we take a given input, phi ij, and we assume that it goes to some new input, alpha phi ij. And just to make it clear in this picture back here, what we're plotting on the y-axis is actually the log of alpha. So actually, I should have put log alpha rather than alpha, excuse me. Um, so and conceptually, we've argued that you have a flow of, of raw materials from uh, reference goods like oil or minerals that you take out of the ground, the commodities that I was talking about before that don't improve, improve very quickly historically, 
to final outputs up here. And as you flow through this graph, um, all of the technologies going up the graph tend to benefit from any improvements that happen beneath them. So there's something very similar to a food chain. There are trophic levels and, and that we can measure in the um, economic input-output matrix. And we see these flows um, from inputs to outputs. And under this hypothesis, things that are higher up the trophic level should improve more quickly. Um, we see some evidence for that. I'm still not satisfied with, with the evidence, but uh, at least anecdotally, this, for instance, is the, we see the various industries uh, between 1997 and 2002, and we see on one hand um, uh, things like uh, sand, gravel, ground mineral, and earth manufacturing over in this part of the curve actually so this is the rate of improvement, so this means the cost went up a bit in unnormalized terms. This means the cost went down. And this is the trophic level here, and we see a tendency as we move from left to right for things on the right to improve faster than the things on the left. Um, and in particular, things like computer manufacturing, which are at the top of the trophic level, also are the things that are improving the fastest. Um, now I'm going to close. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I was hoping to end early and get some questions, so I hope you're thinking about your questions. By talking about work we've been doing on uh, investigating technological evolution via U.S. patents. U.S. patent data set forms a remarkable example of technological change. There's the order of 9 million patents um, from 1790 to present. Um, there are, um, and I should say that, that it, well, from 1790 to present, in, in 1790 there were 10,000 technological codes. There's now 150,000. And um, it's the closest thing we have to a fossil record of technological change. There's many problems with using this data set. Um, everything in this field is looking at shadows on the wall of Plato's cave. But um, nonetheless, it's, it's a quite a remarkable data set. Um, it benefits from the fact that Thomas Jefferson was himself an inventor. He was the first patent examiner. The first patent in the data set is actually Benjamin Franklin's patent for the lightning rod. And, but, but Jefferson actually, so the, the, the need to have a patent office is explicitly in the Constitution. And Jefferson laid down uh, a set of procedures that are still followed significantly to this day. And in particular, the patent office goes to great pains to classify um, <coughs> technologies. Um, we've been looking at what we call the co-occurrence network, defined as a frequency with which two technology codes appear together. Um, <coughs> in this network, the technology codes are nodes, and the co-occurrence frequency is the weighted length. <coughs> this provides a way to understand how technologies interact with each other and how this evolves through time. So in particular, by repeating, using class, constructing a co-occurrence network using classification methods, standard classification networks that are used for network analysis. And <coughs> this is a plot due to Yanis Sorakis, who's, who's in my lab. Um, and doing this decade by decade, and then looking, in this case, what you see is the color code indicates the similarity using mutual information as an indicator between the classification groupings at different points in time. So we're able to compare a classification in 1900 to a classification in 2000 of the inventions that are appearing in each decade. And, and what we see is the co-occurrence frequencies have a kind of block structure that um, um, we argue has to do with self-similarity across time from various historical efforts, eras, um, <coughs> for example, World War I, World War II, and the Cold War, and that, that these reflect shifts in the technologies that are dominant at any given point in time. Um, here's a picture tracing the community dynamics from a somewhat different perspective, again, based on the co-occurrence matrix matrix um, made by Hyjin Yoon and Daniel Kim. Uh, Hyjin is also at Oxford, and Daniel's been visiting us from Korea. And so here, the 
these circles that you see are the communities. So in any given decade, um, these circles indicate the different communities of technologies. And these lines indicate which communities should be mapped into which other communities. And what you see is that through time, the community structure is becoming more coherent and uh, better formed, um, despite the fact that in the early days, by the way, the communities are actually literally disjoint. You have one community of technologies, a completely separated community of technologies. And in later times, um, the graph becomes much more complete, but, um, but much more stable. And um, <coughs> we've been looking very closely at photovoltaic technologies under a grant we've gotten from the US Department of Energy. And so this is a picture that Giannis has made showing the PV technology ecosystem. That is, um, with the help of Debbie, our collaborator, Debbie Strumsky, we've identified the patents that relate to photovoltaics, the technology codes that are related to photovoltaics, because there is no simple technology code that just says photovoltaic. It's all technology codes tend to be at a more fine-grained level. And so we've looked at the 22 photovoltaic-specific technologies. We've looked at the roughly 6,000 technologies that are related by the fact that they appeared in a patent at least one time with these other technologies and looked at the combinations and um, aggregated this across the, the time history. So you can see these large blobs here are the, the, the core PV technologies. Inside, you have technologies that seem to interact a lot with photovoltaics. And out here, you have technologies that just appear on, um, with single other codes and never appear otherwise. So you can form a kind of ecosystem of the PV technology codes, and we're trying to make better sense out of that. Um, we should stress that this ecosystem is vast. We now take <coughs> the co-occurrence matrix for the entire um, set of technologies, the PV technologies are sitting inside a particular neighborhood in that. So this whole picture is, is roughly speaking, contained inside some subset here. Um, on that note, I guess I want to just end with um, a little story. To try and stress how remarkable our economy is and what a remarkable collective complex system it is, um, um, I want you to imagine that <clears throat> somehow we just destroyed all technology. Now, for whatever, for whatever reason. But let's suppose that we do have a library that tells us what we have, how everything works. We have all the books that we need to understand how technology, te to rebuild things. And suppose we even have all the tacit knowledge. We have, you know, all the technicians we need that have expertise in all the technologies that got destroyed so that in principle, we could try and rebuild everything from scratch. And let's suppose we have a century's worth of freeze-dried food, and these guys have a place to live, so they're not struggling to survive. Um, but they are given the task, and, and they, they, through religious conviction, want to recreate the economy that we have now, or something close to it. So, so could we, the first question is, could we even reboot the economy under those circumstances? And how would we do it? What will we have to build first? Because, you know, think about it. You don't even have a shovel. You know, you don't, you have to go back in and <coughs> reinvent flint and steel. And actually, there may be problems with some primitive technologies that you need to get started again to even get the thing going. It would be a huge task. I think if it could be done in a century, it would be remarkable. And I don't think we would end up in reality with something that close to have what we have now. You, you might hope they would make a few improvements. Um, but I think I want to get you to think about that just to underline how massively interconnected our economic production is and how massively interconnected technologies are and how much everything depends on everything else. That is, the economy is strongly autopoetic, um, to use the phrase of, of Francisco Varela. Um, so I want to leave you with that note. I also, I guess, one, one final thought is I think technology is a remarkable thing. And it, technology giveth and technology taketh away. Technology, on one hand, 
is the source of the material wealth that we have. <clears throat> we couldn't exist on Earth with a population even a hundredth of what we have now or a thousandth of what we had now without technology. But technology is also creating our problems. It's technology that's driving global warming now. It's technology that's you know, creating pollution. It's technology that we use to fight each other. So we're in the strange situation where we both depend on technology for so many things that are good, yet we have to somehow contain technology for things that are bad and understand how to use technology to solve our problems. And on that note, I'll end and ask you for some questions. Yes? Oh, excuse me. Thank you very much for your inspiring talk. Um, I teach here at NTU. And um, I wanted to follow up in the need of going beyond the receipt model. Um, I have two short questions uh, related to hidden connection, I think. Uh, when I see the graphs uh, showing cost coming down through time when the production increases, I am thinking about uh, two hidden connections that increase indirectly the production cost over time. First is goods becoming obsolete, and second, storage costs. My question is, which is the time span that makes considerable cost differences if you do not sell what you produce and invalidates the model that you are presenting? First question. The second one is about the PV technologies. Uh, it is connected to the first. So can we measure if PV technologies are a bubble? with your model. That is, uh, which kind of energy is used to produce them? How much CO2 we <coughs> produce in producing photovoltaic panels? And uh, how much less or more of what the panel itself saves during its life? Yeah. So your first question, I, I was not, I don't completely understand. You're asking, uh, well, we obviously you know, producers do worry about inventories. Inventory costs can be quite a significant thing. And um, planned obsolescence or not so planned obsolescence is also an important effect. I mean, we end up wasting things because things become obsolete. And I mean, I think these are important parts of the landscape, but I don't think they're, um, how to put it, they're not the dominant things driving technological change. Uh, and I don't think that, and when you look at it economically, I mean, I, I, as was mentioned, I'm also working on building an agent-based model of the economy where we worry about inventory costs. And um, they're an important effect, but you, know, you can easily, you get a lot of the essence of what's going on without having that in there. Um, on your other question, people have, of course, studied the life cycle of photovoltaics and other uh, ways of generating power quite carefully now. And, what we see is that <clears throat> through time, as we move down this curve, the life cycle <coughs> for P PV is now a net energy producer. It wasn't back in 1950, but it is now a net energy producer. And the CO2 characteristics of PV are extremely good. It's probably the best of, of the, the competitive technologies for producing energy, of course, far better than um, coal or natural gas or um, any of the alternatives. N nuclear is not bad from, a, uh, from that point of view. I think, as, as I suggested, I mean, I think the primary thing to ask is why is it that nuclear uh, electricity has been one of the technologies that has not dropped in cost over a 50 year span? And, and one should factor that into planning in an appropriate way. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this very interesting talk. Uh, you were pointing out that there are large externalities in, in working on a technology because basically the learning curve, others benefit from your investment in the learning curve. And you suggested that the government might play a role in stimulating some of those learning curves. Um, do your, this is basically picking the winners, is the standard argument against that. 
do you think that your pictures or your all, all those things where you see this, uh, these are the hotspots at this moment can be helpful for governments in stimulating certain type of technologies and not stimulating others? Yeah. So I want to stress that um, one of the main things I'm trying to show is there are objective means of making forecasts of technological improvement that give you dramatically different answers. My forecast for nuclear is dramatically different than my forecast for solar PV. And I think the government should take that into account. I think if they don't take it into account, they're just being stupid. And, and um, so we do need to pick the winners because I think the winners, while not clear, that, that we have strong information about what the winners are going to be. Now, also for people who don't think the government has an important role to play in investment, I recommend you read uh, Mariana Matsukato's book, The Entrepreneurial State, which shows you quite dramatically the role the state has played in driving the major technological change. She takes the iPhone, for example, and shows you how every technology in the iPhone was originally supported by the government, and without that support would never have reached the point that it reached. Um, and of course, some of the most dramatic examples are things like the internet. Now, um, what I don't want to say is that supporting production is the sole way the government should participate. The government, uh, my, my guess is a likely a, a more effective way in general is research and development. Um, uh, so research and development plays a very important role in, in these kind of improvements. At the same time, um, actually, I, I wish I had this uh, slide with me. Lest you think regulation doesn't matter, there's a beautiful graph of U.S., the, the fuel efficiency and acceleration of U.S. cars as a function of time. And you see there's a period where the U.S. was mandating that cars had to become more efficient, in which case fuel efficiency and acceleration were tracking along together. And then they remove the regulation, and at that point, fuel efficiency goes flat, acceleration goes right on up the curve. So there's very clear proof that regulation can also play a role in driving uh, and shaping technological improvement in terms of where does the improvement happen? Because you know, one of the points I'm try I was trying to make is that there, there can be many different emphases by the engineers on what they try and do. When Ford says, I want to make the car cheaper, he made the car cheaper. When he said, I want to make the car better, he made the car better. And so while I saw costs going up, if I showed you horsepower, comfort, any one of a number of other, other axes, you would have seen improvement. Being here in Singapore and being myself from the Netherlands, the government, what's the government? Is that Singapore or the Netherlands, or is that only a big country like the United States? Or say it otherwise, choices made by small government have large externalities, and therefore probably you need more coordination among governments? Is that... Well, I think coordination among governments is a good thing. Um, I, I, I am specifically here thinking about developed countries because I think developed countries lead, they're on the forefront of technological improvement. Singapore is now a developed country. And so Singapore, I think, can play its role. And um, um, I, so I think, you know, I think each country is playing, it, playing its own role. So, so I was thinking, I'm trying to get my mind around this, uh, this, this scaling behavior that you observe in the, um, in the production cost versus the production, right? So the example you gave for the um, uh, Blackburn case is actually, you now there's a kind of a learning process going on and people get, you know, more uh, better at doing things. But the other example you were giving, um, I was wondering how much of that is actually due just to the growth of the population in the same time. Right, so if you would look at your x-axis, it just look at the, the number of products, and you showed the comparison with more, so you see that there's actually time scales in there. So if it's time scales, could it not just be that what you're observing is just the growth of the population? Yeah. So there's a theory for technological, endogenous theory of technological growth by Paul Romer that essentially pursues the idea that you just threw out, that maybe what's happening is population goes up. Let's suppose there's you know, one genius inventor per every thousand people. So if you have a population of only 1,000 people, you only have one inventor, you can only, and that inventor can only invent so much. Uh, but if you have 7 billion people, then you have a lot more inventors, and you can make a lot more progress. And Romer argues that's the reason why the US population has undergone super exponential growth. That is, if you plot, the US pop, if you, if you plot the world population through time, then you see that it goes up faster than an exponential. In fact, the best fit is, is to a power law 
with a finite time singularity around 2040 or 2050. Um, so what's the message there? The message is we can't go on doing that because it has a finite time singularity, meaning the population actually goes to infinity in 2050. And in the paper in Nature, where Fun Forster and colleagues publish this, they joked that the world, that the, everybody would die not by starvation but by being smashed together because it happened so quickly. Um, so we're undergoing a phase change in this century in world population growth. Now, if Romer's right, we should see a slowdown in the rate of technological improvement and economic growth that's reflected in that. Um, my own feeling is that that theory isn't really right and that um, technology itself, it, the, the, the big driver of technological, of the acceleration in technological change is the fact that technology leads to better technology, that our palate is getting richer and richer through time, that there's a combinatorial explosion, so that if you imagine what I can create now as an inventor versus what someone could create 100 years ago, I, I mean, I, I have a microprocessor. They didn't have that. The microprocessor enables me to create all kinds of things that simply could not be done. And so the, the space of possibilities is expanding at a huge rate. And well, I think having a large, sufficiently large population is a necessary condition for that. I don't think having an accelerating population is, is necessary. So, so one way to actually investigate that is just normalize your data with respect to the number of people. Yeah, and when you do that, you see that you know, the growth isn't just something in absolute terms. Uh, per capita economic growth also follows a super exponential uh, curve. My question relates to Wright's law. Now, today, the cost of production is going down due to process improvements, application of innovative methods, and globalization. China has become the factory of the world. So how are these factors being uh, influencing the application of Wright's law? Have you factored them in when you did the study? So, um, so this brings up the tricky point that I alluded to that um, Wright's law holds often quite well at the level of an individual product in an individual factory. It often holds quite well for a product across all the different factories that make that specific product. It often holds, the examples I'm giving like transistors, it's we're now talking about physical devices that change quite dramatically through time that are under, you're performing a certain function and across you know, many different fabrication plants and many different epochs of, of computer technology. Now, I think it's a mystery why such a thing can hold in such a general way. And the model that we built, building on Muth and, and Auerswald et al., is, is, all, is a very general model. I don't think it's taking all the factors into account. And I think the correspondence with Blackburn should make you scratch your head to ask, well, Probably this has to be some very general phenomenon. Under some set of circumstances, learning behavior, which whether it be in our brain, it's a collective phenomenon because it's a collective phenomenon involving the many neurons that are involved, or whether it's a collective phenomenon involving many different technologists or even competing factories, and even in some cases competing technologies, because within transistors, there are many competing technologies for making what a transistor is, somehow that same law is still holding true. So it's a mystery. I, I don't have the answer. And it's one of the reasons why I think this is an exciting area, area to work in now.